Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar about online assessment. Thanks a lot for coming along. And welcome to our presenter, Tom Kittle. Thanks, Tom, for presenting. Tom's a director of Nile in Norwich in the UK. He has a master in, master's in language assessment, and he did his dissertation on assessing speaking online. Um, he's also the founding director of Aquaduto, and you can Google Aquaduto for their latest publication. And it stands for the Association for Quality Education and Training Online. He is the webmaster for the Testing, Evaluation and Assessment Special Interest Group of IATEFL. And he's the vice chair of the Equals Board of Trustees. So thanks a lot, Tom, for presenting for us tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you very much to, to English Australia for um, inviting me to, to talk um, to you what's this evening for you and, and nine o'clock in the morning here in Norwich. Um, you're forgiven if you if you haven't heard of Norwich. We're um, uh, in what um, was the second most important, second biggest uh, city in England, but that was 800 years ago. So um, not, not so uh, well known internationally uh, anymore as a city, but maybe you've heard of Nile, um, Norwich Institute for Language Education, where I'm director. As Sophie said, my, my academic background is, is in um, teaching and training. Uh, I, I have been a, a teacher uh, and teacher trainer for 25 years, and it's now uh, almost 20 years ago that I, I left Australia having worked um, in language schools uh, on the East Coast, um, and I've been here at Nile for the last 10 years. Um, so I'm really going to be talking about um, aspects of online assessment and, and uh, particularly online testing and, and the current situation globally and what that's meant for um, institutions, teachers and learners around the world in, in terms of a, a shift to online education and the, the place of uh, testing and assessment within that. Um, and I'll talk through my thoughts on this, some of the principles that I think are um, inherent within that for us to, to hold dear and also the practicalities of trying to make sure that um, it's not just good enough, but we feel confident that what we're doing in terms of online assessment is, is good. Um, so, uh, the the aims uh, that we're trying to cover in the session um, it's really just to, to address the elephant in the room of uh, should we be testing in a similar or, or different ways in this current situation the importance of playing to our strengths some of those options for delivery of online assessment um, the aspect of cheating uh, and managing uh, the temptation for, for cheating uh, opportunities for rethinking our, our assessment approach that this may have uh, given us as a, as a move to online assessment and that would include thinking about portfolio approaches, thinking about the role of integrated skills and thinking about um, assessment that's maybe not fixed in a, in a um, live time period but that takes a, a broader approach to um, uh, open book and collaborative uh, assessment. So that's the aim but let's start um, with a test as we're uh, online and this is about online assessment so I'm going to give you a, a, a short test here it's a very simple test and it's got a single question it's a multiple choice question and the question is um, which tree is the biggest now you may be thinking if you're fast on the keys you may like to share your your opinions in the chat box there which tree is the biggest Now your pauses may be because you're thinking, well, how do I know? How can I possibly answer that question? Could it be A, perhaps covering the most physical space? Could it be B, the, the tallest? Could it be C, the biggest girth? Could it be D, the, uh, the deepest roots? And of course, the only fair answer to this question is it depends. And it depends isn't uh, isn't a bad answer. It just means uh, the question's not very good. We haven't formulated the question correctly. Um, and so, the the analogy with with language assessment here is obviously we need to be making our questions appropriate for the situation we're in, defining what we're trying to find out before we can ever hope to give uh, a realistic and appropriate and accurate measurement. Um, but 
language assessment is even harder than this. If we defined whether we were looking at tree height or, or number of leaves on a tree or circumference of a trunk, it would be fairly easy to count this. But language uh, performance, language use, language knowledge doesn't stay still. Perhaps a better analogy than, than a tree is, is a, a swarm of bees. And uh, language grows and expands and can be very compact in particular situations, but can spread out over wide areas. All of these individual items of language knowledge combining and moving and swaying uh, for particular situations, particular uh, language use situations, particular demands of use. So the question for us is, where on earth do we decide to, to cut and measure uh, something so dynamic as this? This is one of the challenges we have when we're thinking about assessment and particularly language assessment. How can we be confident that where we decide to slice, measure um, and give a, uh, a score, some uh, qualitative comment is an accurate and appropriate um, reflection of the uh, candidate's level of ability at that particular moment. And it's not just that, that dynamic nature of language and language um, use that we, we have to contend with. There's another couple of points to, to put on the table at the start there. Um, I think uh, encompassed really with these two quotes. The first one you may be familiar with, been attributed to, to many different people. Um, the, the one I could find in the literature was from 1963. And it's a very interesting point, this idea that not everything that can be counted counts. There are lots of things that we could measure in terms of language knowledge, language um, use, language awareness, but do they really count towards the, the picture of language proficiently proficiency that we want to uh, we want to use we want to to apply to a student we want to be representative of, of their performance and perhaps even more important not everything that counts can be counted we know the importance in language of, of motivation perhaps of, of aptitude perhaps of um, the way in which uh, learner autonomy can be developed and can be taken as part of a learner's proficiency. But can we really count those? Can we put numbers to those things? Can we say, well, your motivations are five, your motivations are four? Um, we could try, but are they, are they really um, reflectable in a testing situation? We know they're important, but how do we, how do we take these into account in our, in our general statement of, of language proficiency and language performance? So we've got that issue of are we measuring the right things, which those of you who are uh, interested or involved in assessment may be thinking in terms of the construct of what we're trying to measure. And we've also got this other challenge, which is actually it's much more complicated than rocket science. We're trying to describe when we talk about language performance and language proficiency, very complex dynamic phenomena. And we have to do that in quite a small number of words because we have to consider the stakeholders who are receiving this number of words, not just the, uh, the candidate themselves who gets a, a number or a grade or a statement of, of their uh, language ability, but other people who might want to use that statement. The, um, uh, the university entrance uh, teams, it may be parents in some situations, it may be the school, the institution that's using these statements for the basis of progression or, or exit or, or certification. And really, our theories behind language use and language development are incomplete. We're not 100% sure that we're making stats within the industry to understand the, the neurological processing that happens when we learn a second language, how it combines with our first language knowledge, what um, the important steps are, what the, um, the thresholds might be between moving levels. Um, but we've got all of these challenges that uh, belong to language assessment generally. And in a way, those are amplified and multiplied when we think about having to do this in an online context. So with those kind of challenges on the um, <coughs> uh, set down as, as foundations, how do, we, how do we address those? Well, one of the first things I think we have to address to be fair to ourselves and to be fair to our learners is to think about um, the question of to test or not to test. We know there's massive upheaval, there's massive upheaval globally, there's massive upheaval in social, political, economic terms right now, and there's massive upheaval in terms of education. We're all part of this. We've all had to uh, change very rapidly 
towards a teaching and learning process that may in many situations have been unplanned or have been uh, plans that were in development that have been uh, fast tracked to, to uh, offer some kind of service to the to the learners we're working with we know that the learning that we're offering to our students is perhaps uh, it's certainly different is it of an equivalent standard we're struggling with these aspects of how do we manage the teaching and learning process so is it fair that we actually approach testing at all at the moment would it be fairer in some aspects to say, well, testing needs to take a back seat because all we can focus on really now is providing a learning experience. And we know that that will affect people differently. It will affect teachers differently. And of course, that means it will affect progress differently. So is testing the right approach to take? In the UK, the, the, um, the government's decision about the uh, the summative um, exams at the uh, crucial points at uh, 16 and 18, the GCSEs and the A-levels, their approach has been to cancel exams completely and they've moved away from a testing system to a, a score for performance and progress based on previous predicted grades, based on teacher assessment, subjective teacher assessment, and more controversially, to school performance in previous years. Now, I'm not saying that any of those are particularly the right way to go, but it's interesting to consider other approaches that remove testing completely from uh, an approach to language or to, to measurement of educational performance. And so the question I think we have to keep uh, in our minds as we as we move through this is whether we're prepared to trust ourselves and our students to think about other ways we might measure language proficiency that, that challenge us to, to re-examine the way we've previously measured language performance and, and language knowledge, and maybe to shift the balance. Maybe it's a question of shifting the weighting of the relative importance we give to different aspects of our assessment system because we're in a situation where everything else is in upheaval. So maybe the most uh, applicable approach is not just to do what we've always done before, but think creatively and in a principled way about alternatives to assessment and at alternative assessment. However, easy for me to say, much more difficult in the reality of what we need to do and we, what, we, we, what we need our tests to do and our assessment to do in terms of the learners and the progress they need and the stakeholders who require this information. So if we're in a situation where we think, yes, that's all very well, but we have to do this for a number of reasons, what are our key approaches going to be in this? Well, I think one of the key things to, to, uh, for schools, for institutions, for, for teachers, for, for directors to bear in mind at this point is to play to your strengths, to really make sure that those things that you're doing uh, capture the most um, solid professional aspects of your uh, resources, whether they are uh, human resources, whether they are um, physical resources, whether they are financial resources. We need to think, what is it that we can do best in terms of test delivery, assessment creation and assessment delivery in the situation we have with the resources we have. And one of the key things to remember with that is the fact that depending on the testing approach that we take, the responsibility for the quality of the test lies in different situations. If we choose an approach or we choose to, um, to transport a previous approach that's based around selected response items, that's um, multiple choice, true, false, short answer questions, which can be clerically marked, which have a, an answer key. Yes, it's easy to mark those and perhaps it's easy to deliver those in a, um, an online setting easy in inverted commas. Obviously, there's lots of caveats to that, which we'll talk about in a moment. But we need to remember that in that situation, then the responsibility for quality really lies in the hands of the test design team. It's the test development, the item writers, the item editors, um, where the quality needs to, to lie. So if we're really confident that that's where the strength of our organization lies in terms of designing good items, designing tasks that can be marked clerically, that can really address aspects of um, student performance in a, in a reliable, maybe more standardized way, then that's certainly where we can put our resources, putting it into creating those tests which are easy to mark and can be delivered individually with uh, perhaps less uh, uh, 
invigilator assessor time, but the quality has to lie in the test designers. If, on the other hand, the quality in an institution, the real resource lies in the, um, the quality of perhaps the teachers, the people who are marking the test, the people who have the expert judgment to, to assess um, the, the performance on a qualitative level, then constructed response tasks may seem the way to go because in constructed response tasks, so extended spoken tasks, extended written tasks, the main responsibility for the quality of the, the assessment lies in the hands of the people who are marking those tests, who are using those scales, who are making those qualitative judgments. So we need to make quite a, an important decision about what are we going to put in terms of resource and where's our best resource to ensure the quality. Now, I know that English Australia has quality at its heart. It's the first of the, um, the nouns in your, uh, in your slogan, uh, in your um, logo there. So thinking about that quality and where you can put the responsibility for that quality is a crucial aspect of deciding how your assessment and your online assessment is going to, is going to look and is going to um, be operationalized. One of the other strengths that I think we have in this in this industry, in our sector, is the amount of resource that's out there to relate, to align uh, our testing approaches to. And I think certainly in our context, and I'm sure in your context, the CEFR is probably the number one of those um, alignment frameworks that we can talk in a similar language, that we can relate our uh, assessment outcomes and our assessment tasks and perhaps even our assessment approach, the, the construct that we define as part of our assessment, to something which is um, international currency and also has this depth of, of um, research into it, but also depth of resource in, uh, in what it is as a, a set of descriptive scales. And I just wanted to, to make you aware of a tool which might support you in this endeavor, which is something we've, we've developed at Nile. Um, the CEFR, as I'm sure you know, is this um, framework of reference, which is uh, operationalized in, in a, a huge number of descriptive scales with illustrative descriptors at the um, the six key levels and also the plus levels, which have had much more work in them in the companion volume launched in 2018. Um, but how do, we, how do we process those? How do we extract the ones that are relevant to our context or relevant to our level and relevant to our learners? Well, one of the things that we've developed is um, a, a filtering tool for the, for the CEFR, which you can get access to um, through the Nile membership uh, space. It's a completely free space, but if you could click through and go to the membership area, register, and you'll come to the membership home. And in the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see the CFR filtering tool. And all the CFR filtering tool is, is a, an Excel spreadsheet with all of the descriptors from the, um, the new companion volume um, with filters. So you can decide, I'm interested particularly in all the descriptors at A2+, plus, for example, and I'm interested particularly in the new descriptors that relate to mediation competencies, and so I'm going to filter just for those. So I know that I can, I can take the scales which are focusing on a particular area, whether that's a particular skill or a particular community of strategy or a particular area of language competence, and we can get those descriptors for the level so we know that the assessment outcomes we're describing are aligned to all the scales that are relevant rather than flicking through a, a 280 page document in order to try and uh, isolate these from individual descriptive scales. So hopefully that's a tool which can be one of the strengths that you uh, adopt as you, as you make decisions about your own assessment process. Um, so we've got the principle of Am I going to take a, a testing approach that's similar to what I did before? How am I going to transfer that with the resources that I have available? Where does my quality lie in terms of the resources that I have in my institution? Um, what other tools and resources are out there to help me do that in a principled way that's aligned to international standards? And then, of course, we have to move on to the, the considerations for, for delivery. What are our options for delivering these, uh, these assessments in an online space? Well, I think we've really got um, four basic approaches that we can consider as part of delivery of online assessment. Um, many of you may have taken a shift to, uh, um, to online teaching and learning, which is essentially trying to recreate a face-to-face -face classroom experience by providing a live synchronous space um, for 
uh, doing lessons live in much the same way as teacher with a group of students in a, in a live session as you would have done in a face-to-face -face classroom. But many of you may have already had the capacity or have created the capacity to also look at asynchronous learning and tasks and collaborative activities and activities that learners can do outside the live space which contribute to their learning. If you have, you've probably investigated or repurposed or extended your use of a, a VLE, a virtual learning environment. And most virtual learning environments will have capacity for assessment as well, whether you're using Moodle or Blackboard or, or Google Classroom or one of these VLEs, all of them will have some aspect of uh, assessment, whether that's quizzes, whether that's assignments, whether that's um, some other form of uh, collaborative task tool your own capacity may be enhanced and your decisions may be made easier by the capacity that your VLE has. So one of the options for delivery is to say, well, what can our current VLE do? If you're not happy with that, then maybe you need to look outside that and, and places to um, look outside this, maybe to go down the, the free route of, of aspects of um, software platforms tools which maybe weren't designed explicitly for assessment or even language assessment um, but can be repurposed can be adopted to to provide a, a testing platform an assessment space that we can harness for the um, the tests the assessments we need to deliver um, some of those that we'll be re mentioning later things that are kind of those i guess almost um ubiquitous Google Drive for many students, very familiar things, using Google Docs, using Google Forms, using those uh, online assessment tools like Socrative, um, which allow you to create uh, short quizzes, um, mainly on the selected response aspect. Um, and adapting and adopting those can provide a solution in a in a situation where you're thinking okay i don't have this capacity in my vle but i need something to bring in of course there's a, a development of, of technical uh, competence inherent in those I, I would like to recommend the the videos you may well be aware of these russell stannard's one of the trainers at niles but he's got some great videos on lots of different aspects of these free tools or freemium ones that have a free basis and then a, a subscription for more advanced um, uh, permissions um, and so the videos there about how to insert video how to insert audio into google forms for example very specific videos which guide you to how you can put things into uh, these free third-party tools you may think there's too little in terms of kind of back office management available in these third party tools. You may think that actually it doesn't allow you to control students, it doesn't allow you to, to, um, to set the parameters for how they access or uh, it may put too much responsibility on students in terms of creating their own accounts and their own sign-ins. So you want to consider something that has a bit more uh, testing specific purpose and you'll probably be aware of different platforms which have been created uh, over the last 10 years to really address this aspect of um, uh, test delivery in an online space. Uh, I'm not going to specify any particular one um, or, or recommend one, but um, there are many out there whose purpose is to have a back office space for, for learner management and for administration and a, uh, a candidate facing space which is designed for assessment. So is it effective in terms of your financial resources to consider a, a specific testing platform? And I think the fourth option you have is to talk to the publishers which you work with. I know many of you will be representing organizations which, which use a particular course book and have a good relationship with a publisher. What do they have in terms of uh, progress testing, um, achievement testing related to the course materials that they have, which can be used for your particular, uh, for your particular needs? So considering those four options, and, and I think for many people, the, uh, the solution will be a combination of these things and you'll need to think about which ones are most appropriate considering the kind of testing you're doing. There may be ones which you think are wholly appropriate for a placement testing instrument which has low stakes because you can make uh, decisions and move people uh, after this when you see how effective the testing has been. 
but not appropriate for a proficiency or exit or progress um, uh, uh, progression testing, which have higher stakes and which uh, you need to satisfy requirements of other stakeholders. So the combination of these will very much relate on, uh, to the, the type of testing you're doing from placement to progress to achievement to proficiency to progression. Um, and so it may be that considering all of these will result in your assessment package being quite bespoke for your particular institution. Another thing that we have to consider then is, um, well, if we're delivering these online, what have we lost in terms of our ability to control certain aspects of the test setting? What do we think is slipping out of our grasp, what's falling through the through the net? What is it that we we aren't able to control in the way we were able to when we had the face-to-face -face, uh, testing possibilities? And we may be considering um, some of these aspects that actually we value very highly these kind of 21st century skills of collaboration, of, of using learners working together to develop their language proficiency, to encourage teamwork and being able to share resources with each other and at times take a leadership role and at times listen to others. We value in the classroom the, the idea of peer communication, supporting each other, uh, learning from each other. Uh, we very much value the aspect of digital literacy, which allows people to draw in resources from around the internet, the, the uh, multitude of, uh, of options for, for enhancing your uh, I guess professional performance, your academic performance, your language performance, which we do in in real life. But the problem for us is that all of these things which you value so highly in the professional, academic, uh, language education world, when we put them into a testing context, we tend to think of them as cheating. Collaboration is cheating. Working with a peer is cheating. Using other digital resources to make your performance better is cheating. And this is a, a kind of um, a, a real difficult challenge, a real difficult problem to overcome because we know that in our target language use situations, the situations which our learners are going to go into, whether that's professional, academic, uh, or, or even just in the personal domain, they will use these resources and they'll be absolutely right to and they're valued as, as key 21st century skills. But how do we square that circle in terms of controlling the test setting in which we have um, to, to produce reliable and fair and individually specified uh, results. Well, I think we have to kind of flip this around a bit and think about what do we have in terms of advantages in the online space? And this really comes down to what are we gonna do in terms of invigilating the assessment setting, the test uh, event? sometimes known as proctoring, this kind of monitoring, invigilating, what are learners doing? Well, I think the first thing to say to, to people who are involved on an institutional basis is be realistic about what standards you can set for yourselves. It's unfair to a, a small institution to, to measure itself in terms of uh, online delivery by the standards of exam boards. And we know that exam boards are struggling with this challenge as well. In a recent um, update from the ISEF monitor, I've got um, reports on new approaches, new uh, testing approaches put into place by Pearson, by TOEFL, by IELTS, by ITEP, by Cambridge LinguaSkill, by, by LanguageSet, even Duolingo advertising um, a live interview component with an online proctor now. They're all struggling to meet this challenge as well. So you have to be realistic about um, the, the standards that they can set for themselves and potentially achieve with their teams of experts and their dedicated specialists designing these tools but do investigate the way they are approaching this. Do have a look at some of the, the approaches they're taking, whether this is um, secure browsers, whether this is uh, live uh, proctoring, whether this is um, some other uh, approach to staggering the assessment to, to achieve reliability through sampling on a broader level rather than just a single test setting. So be fair to yourself in terms of what you can achieve, but investigate what other exam boards are doing that you can perhaps um, learn from and adapt in terms of principles, if not the tools they're using uh, 
specifically. But is there anything that actually we can do better when we assess online? Can we improve our test security compared to what we would have done in a face-to-face -face setting? I mean, if, if we were to say in a, a test setting where we were trying to uh, measure speaking with uh, live face-to-face -face, uh, interlocutor, assessor and candidates, and we wanted to move to the situation of everybody having a separate room and every session uh, every exam session being recorded that can be then used for um, second marking or for quality control or for review, um, assessment review, that's a, that's a challenge to do in a face-to-face -face setting. But potentially with these um, live web meeting sessions like we're in now, the options of breakout rooms and recording, as long as we get candidate permissions, can actually be operationalized in, a, in an improved way, being able to have people into a, a single main room to, to set the test um, parameters, the test instructions, putting people into breakout rooms to practice, then the, uh, the assessor singly or, or assessor and interlocutor can move between breakout rooms. The recording device for something like Zoom will follow the presenter, so it will record each of the sessions that the, uh, the, the presenter, the host, the moderator, who is the assessor, goes into. And then we get this recording, which allows us to have um, the, the whole test uh, uh, collected in one place and the recordings of the individual performance as the uh, the uh, assessor has moved between the breakout rooms. Now, doing that in a single space and a single recording in a face-to-face -face setting is far more challenging than doing it in an online setting. With writing, with a constructed response task, we can have this option of uh, setting something like Google Docs, where we can see live contributions. We can have, as, a, as the assessor, as the monitor, we can have all of the Google Docs that are being worked on live open for the candidates, and we can see instances of uh, chunked copying and pasting. We can see the, uh, the language being written live and we can uh, drop in and monitor from that space and uh, we can then ask people to, to uh, come in live to, a, a, I guess, a proctoring session um, to check that they are doing that with their camera on as well as with the document that we can see they're contributing to or they're working individually on at the same time. We also have the history attached to those so we can see the time frame which it was done on and we can close and remove the access to those um, when we as the, the institution or the teacher own that um, Google Doc. We've got options of doing things on a perhaps more informal way. Uh, a really nice idea that I heard of recently was um, using a uh, using a live setting and setting tasks, um, and then students using the individual chat box response to the teacher to put in their short answers, their 20 word, their 30 word, their three word answer to the questions that the teacher sets in the uh, in the open space. And then the chat can be exported and then that becomes evidence of the students um, responses in a live setting. We've got them in their setting with their cameras on so we can see it's them working, but the chat, the response is not shared between each other, it's recorded from their contribution to the chat box which is exported by the teacher as the assessment evidence. We've got tools like Padlet which we can um, have approvals of posts so we can set a we can set a task on a, a padlet we can take the students there with a link from the chat box we can set a task there and ask them to post their response in that live moment whether that's a um, a short answer to a question or whether that's a more extended response to a question but by putting the post approval setting on they don't see each other's posts as they um, as they click submit it's only when the teacher clicks approve post at the end of the, the session that all of those become visible. So we've got these different tools that perhaps we can adapt and we can adopt for our uh, setting, which actually make that invigilation something more manageable, something more approachable, something that we can get some uh, confidence that we are, um, we are monitoring in a live space. We have to consider what's happening in the world behind the webcam. 
I think there are some procedures that we can put in place if we do want to take the stakes a little bit higher and we want to be more confident about the security that we're establishing there. We can ask learners to um, show into their web camera other devices that they have. So I need to see your phone and I need to see you placing it into the camera's view behind you so I can see that you're not using that um, you know, behind the screen so the device is always visible in the web camera. We can keep a, a, a track and a part of our monitoring is to keep a note of connection outages where the camera goes off for any particular candidate and that may be a, a a point of disqualification if we have to have a, a very high stakes, uh, high stakes approach or a, an opportunity to do the test again at another time. So we're keeping track of these outages and to ask people if they are doing an assessment task that's more um, writing based that we use something like the chat box individually to say to them to uh, turn on their webcam and just demonstrate that it's them at points during the test. All of these may be uh, additional, uh, maybe factors which might affect the test process, but they are potentially possible to allow us to do some more of this online proctoring um, in our live assessment settings. The most important thing to consider is that those procedures are clearly explained from the from the outset so that they don't come as a surprise during the, the test setting for the, for the candidates. Uh, many of these aspects that I've uh, shown here have come from um, different schools working uh, on our new Take Your School Online course that we've worked with at Nile, and we've brought in uh, examples from different schools around the world who are trialing and trying out these aspects. And one of the interesting things about the world that we're, we're living in, the situation that we're coping with, is that we're developing best practice collaboratively. And even in the, in the teaching sense, the, the teacher who may have um, risen to the position of teacher trainer or director of studies because of 20, 30 years of classroom experience is as much of a novice in the online learning world as, as a teacher who's now actually getting more classroom experience in the online setting than, than, their, um, than their trainers, than their managers, than their you know, academic coordinators. So we have to harness these aspects of best practice, these innovations, this creativity that comes from our teacher team as well. Um, and the, the kind of the proof of the pudding of these is, is in the delivery and in the iteration and in the revision of them. One of the other advantages of, of the online space is that we can iterate and we can make changes from test uh, administration to test administration, things that work well, things that we want to hold, things that we need to tweak, things that we need to completely uh, reinvent because they didn't work. Um, so I think there are a lot of options that are out there in terms of uh, online invigilation, but you have to be fair to yourself in terms of the standards you, you set and as long as you've set those principles out, this is the way we're going to uh, um, ensure or try to assure test security um, and they're clear to the candidates and the learners, then that's uh, a way that you're approaching it in the best way you can. Um, so we do have aspects there if we want to do live testing in terms of a fixed start time and a fixed end time in the kind of traditional examining space. But it's also important to consider the other opportunities that we might have to, to re-examine or to, to investigate for the first time other aspects of assessment approach. Are there alternatives to assessment um, that we could consider introducing into our, our assessment approach? Is this an opportunity for changing the way we think about language assessment and measuring language performance? One approach might be to think about portfolio assessment. There are lots of digital tools out there which allow learners to, to collect, to curate and to present evidence, whether that's evidence of progress or evidence of performance, whether that's a criterion-based portfolio where everybody submits the same kind of thing, or whether that's a, a showcase portfolio where students present uh, their, their best uh, examples of their work. Lots of ways we can collate and, and curate these with individual spaces for each student which can form part of a, a broader measurement of, of language performance and something that's potentially more um, more useful, more usable beyond the uh, the immediate educational setting. Collecting 
evidence of your uh, oral performance, of your performance on video, of your written performance, of your test results, uh, of your um, uh, responses to particular listening tasks, of, of um, reading that you've done and your uh, responses to that in a single digital space actually forms a very powerful tool, not only for demonstration of your ability to an external stakeholder, but also for measuring your own progress and developing that kind of learner autonomy in terms of self-assessment and, and seeing where the strengths are, where the progress has been, and making concrete that's something that's often quite ephemeral in the classroom setting. It's very hard to, to track your own spoken performance when you're in a classroom setting and it's performed at one time and, and the teacher gives you a mark, but you don't have it concretely. This may be a way to actually capture some of that performance evidence that you can use and revisit and you can use for all sorts of um, uh, assessment purposes. So we might think that portfolio can play a, a greater role in our assessment approach, particularly for those of you who work in extensive longer term um, educational settings. We might also want to revisit the concept of uh, measuring integrated skills rather than separating the language skills out into four separate skills to be measured independently um, and to measure the kind of enabling competencies of grammar and vocabulary separately. It may be an opportunity to, to revisit the idea of integrated assessment. I personally am a great believer in, in the value of integrated assessment because I think its relation to authenticity and real world language use is far stronger. It's so rare in um, real world professional academic language use to use a single skill on its own. We're almost always combining reading into writing or listening into writing or listening into speaking or reading into speaking. We're almost always doing these things in combination. So why do we need only to, to measure them in isolation? particularly if we go back to the, the CEFR, um, yes, of course, we have to beware of uh, the spork, beware of trying to mix two things which, which muddy the issue. Perhaps integrated skills aren't the best approach when we want to be diagnostically measuring performance. But if we're um, able to think about uh, language proficiency in terms of language use, then there's so much resource in the new companion volume of the CEFR, which asks us to think about language in terms of integrated skills and the way that they relate to real world use. You can see some I've taken from just a couple of scales at, at B2 here, that the CEFR now describes integrated language use as specific language outcomes can make accessible for others the main contents of a spoken or written text by paraphrasing in simpler language. So inherent in the, the description there is the construct of listening into speaking or listening into writing or reading into speaking or reading into writing. So we can actually align our integrated skills approach to CEFR descriptors, as well as kind of maybe a, a more traditional approach, which says there's a listening scale and a writing scale and never the twain shall meet. So we do have the option of, of thinking about integrated skills as uh, perhaps a reweighting of the assessment approach we take to the, the skills in our setting. And this may, play to the strengths I was talking about earlier, that actually the strengths in my organization are the subjective rating by the experts I have in my teaching team, and therefore a listening into writing approach or a reading into speaking approach allows me to play to those strengths where the, the quality lies in the rating of the performance rather than writing effective multiple choice questions for a reading text. So, Certainly portfolio assessment, certainly uh, thinking about integrated skills as a, a reweighting of the way we approach assessment. And I think we can also think about other ways to approach assessment, which is controlled, but is not controlled in that timed one hour exam setting. Um, there's a really interesting test which has been around for a number of years called the test of interactional English. And this uh, really takes almost an open book approach to assessment. It says that preparation for task performance is part of the testing construct. And so if you look at the, um, the preparation 
approach for this test. It says, how do I prepare? Well, you do three tasks and record them in your journal, in your logbook. You carry out a project that's of interest to you. You read a book that you choose at your level. You follow a news story that's current and uh, contemporary on the TV or on radio. And actually, the performance is based on having brought in these resources from outside. It's not based on that kind of surprise element of sit down in the room and now here I'm going to give you something you've never seen before. It's based on bringing in the resources that you've used um, in your uh, extended life outside the, the test setting, but making them the focus of the, um, the assessment approach. I think it's a really interesting uh, aspect of assessment to consider that whether this may relate more closely to real world uh, language use that actually we embrace the open book approach and we give students time to do the assessment tasks and encourage them to use the resources that are out there rather than saying the only way to test your language is to remove you of any of the scaffolding any of the support that you'd have in the real world so i think we can consider project-based assessment more open book assessment, giving students 24 hours to respond to a, an assessment task using the external resources and where we're perhaps lowering the reliability um, of, of the test security, we're raising the authenticity and the validity of the, um, the, uh, the construct we're, we're measuring there. Another approach will be other ways we can um, revisit collaborative tasks. We know that 21st century skills are important in the workplace. We know they're key uh, academic competences. Is there a way that we can broaden our assessment approach to include learners working together on a piece of work that's performed? We know that tools such as Google Docs record who's contributed what to a, a created piece of work, for example. Is this something we can embrace and have as part of our, our measurement approach in an online setting? These digital tools perhaps offer more uh, consistency of uh, measurement of the different contributions in a collaborative task than putting learners around a desk and coming back for their presentation an hour later. So all four of these um, ways of approaching assessment may be worth consideration in a broader approach to assessment given the, the situation we're in. What I think we do need to remember is that whatever we choose, our learners will surprise us. There's nothing quite as, I guess, demoralizing as a, a language teacher or a language tester than setting out something which you think is going to be the right way and the best way to measure learners and then receiving answers which totally confound your expectations and which think, how on earth did they get to that from the task I thought I'd set? What the clarity you thought you had in your design doesn't come out in the in the delivery. One of my favorite ones of these uh, students thinking uh, outside the box. Um, a nice clear statement to try and uh, get the, the historical knowledge uh, required in the measurement of this test. Where is the American Declaration of Independence signed? Put this into a live exam. What does the student respond? At the bottom. So students will always confound us, but this again is one of the advantages of online assessment, being able to be iterative, being able to revisit, being able to revise the, the assessment approaches we take. Um, and again, doing this collaboratively. And I think it, you as a community with your assessment SIG in, in English Australia, um, sharing best practice, talking about what works well, sharing your experiences as we all face this challenge are some of the, uh, the crucial things that um, we can do as a kind of education community to, to face the challenges that are on us at the moment. The Ideas that I've shared here have come from a, a number of spaces, um, that, a lot of work that we've been doing at Nile, uh, my own experience of uh, assessment and um, measurement and language education, but particularly from a, a new Take Your School Online course that we've developed, which has a, a particular unit on assessment and certification. We run this course every, uh, every month. Um, the, the June one is in full swing and is, is full in terms of participants who are school managers, school owners, school directors, um, 
language university preparatory program uh, managers just getting to grips with the collaborative approach to best practice in online teaching uh, and learning and assessment and also there are specific courses from Niall on um, testing and assessment as part of our summer and autumn courses. Some of the things that I've shown you today uh, would include our Take Your Teaching Online course, which is a course for teachers, tell it, teaching them how to get to grips with, um, uh, with the, the new world of, of online teaching and learning, including ways of, uh, of measuring progress and performance. And that's a, a really uh, short self-access course, Take Your Teaching Online. And also, hopefully, you'll be able to find some of the resources in the Nile membership home uh, applicable to you, not just the CEFR tool, which I, I showed you earlier, but a, a free text analyzer tool for looking at the way your texts are composed in, in language terms, a load of different activity cards if you're a teacher trainer, if you're a teacher, all sorts of great activities which work, and um, a glossary of uh, hundreds of terms in our field which are defined, exemplified and which have further reading for each term if you're taking on a more uh, academic um, role or qualification at the moment. So there's loads of resources there from Nile, um, and I hope this session has been one of them which has given you some food for thought, maybe confirmed some beliefs you had, maybe challenged some ideas you had, and hopefully given you some, some inspiration to go on and, and meet the challenge head on that uh, we're all facing uh, at the moment. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I'm gonna ask Sophie to come back in and, and take any questions you have um, for, the, for the last few minutes of the session. Great, thank you so much for that, Tom. Yeah, and if people can just type their questions in, if you have any. So the first question that's come through, someone's asked if you can outline the Padlet post-approval setting writing activity for testing that you described. Yeah, okay, so uh, I'm assuming that you, you're in some way aware of Padlet as a tool, uh, it's a kind of, uh, might be described as an infinite digital canvas. So it's a space on which you can uh, create a, uh, a digital canvas uh, and you can own that as the teacher and you can give the link um, for that to your learners. Now, in a kind of, in a teaching and learning setting, Padlet is often used for um, collaborative contributions of digital content. You can post into that, video, you can post into that audio, you can post links, you can post documents, but you can also write. Now, one of the settings in Padlet when you're the, the owner of the digital space is to uh, check the box or click the slider which says require post approval. And that means that only the, um, only the teacher will see the posts which are put onto that digital space by the students. One of the challenges is when we're doing something live and it's a shared space, as soon as one student posts an answer, everybody can see that answer and copy it. So if we have as the, the main content of a Padlet digital space, the task or the question, then learners can um, see that question, type or, uh, or in an audio file, record their response to that, click submit, whereas normally that would go in and be visible to everybody who has the link, it actually just sits on the teacher's screen with a, um, a little button saying approve. So all the teacher needs to do when they've collected those is to um, end the Padlet session or uh, um, not click approve until after they've taken the, the link away from public viewing and then click approve and then all of those responses form a, um, uh, a digital canvas with each individual's response visible. And then you can use that for formative feedback. You can then invite the learners to see it again and to see everybody else's response once you've, once you've approved them. Um, and you can use that for formative feedback or, or um, remedial work on particular areas. Um, but because it's a, a, an infinite canvas, it can expand to take the responses of uh, as many learners as you have. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining that process. Um, someone else has asked how you can see students writing on Google Docs. Okay, so um, 
when you when you're the owner of a Google Doc, uh, you are able to see who's contributing in real time. Okay, so um, we would need to create a, a Google Doc for each of the learners in an assessment. Uh, let's assume we're doing this as individual rather than collaborative assessment. So we create a series of Google Docs. The link is then individual to the candidate. They get the link just for their doc. The doc is owned by the teacher. And then as the students are doing the task in a, in a timed setting, the teacher can flick between the documents and see their the language being produced in real time. It's like being able to walk around a classroom and look over students' shoulders as they're performing a writing task. But we also have the history of that. So you can see that if there's a chunk of text that's been pasted in in one big block, then that's possibly been copied and pasted from somewhere else. And you can also um, measure expectations of time taken from your knowledge of students to, to see if they are able to respond to the task in real time uh, rather than with um, you know taking much uh, longer to do a task than they would in a, a non-assessment setting one of the schools which is doing this um, talked about it on our take your school online course and they said actually it really does measure up with expectations of, of learner speed of, of writing being able to see this and being able to know the student who's contributing to it and flicking through those docs is a really effective way of uh, seeing that students are, are doing the writing in real time as we speak. And of course, if we add to that, the fact that they may have this as a, a link open while in a, live, um, in a live meeting session, so we can also have that proctoring of their face on the screen, um, it's a kind of combination of uh, we can see that we can see what they're writing at the same time as we can see them writing it. Okay, great. So someone's just asked if the same Google Doc approach would work using a shared Office document. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, anything that allows real-time collaboration. So that means collaboration oh. only in the sense that two people can be working on it at the same time, the, the teacher who owns it and the, the student who's contributing to it, any um, live uh, collaborative document that's hosted online uh, can perform the same job. Okay, and just another quick question around Padlet, is that feature that you've described in the free version? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, when Padlet was launched, I kind of, uh, what was it called? Wall, uh, something wall, back, back in the day, you could have an unlimited number of, uh, of digital spaces for your free version. I think uh, they reduced it to seven and then to five. It now even may be as strict as three digital spaces that you can have in the free version. Um, but of course, you can reuse those. So you essentially, you do your assessment task, you, uh, you approve the responses so they sit there, you take a screenshot and save that as a JPEG, and then you reuse that digital space for your ne next task. So in the free version, yes, you can have a maximum of three, but uh, you can reuse them by uh, screen, screen grabbing the, um, uh, the completed task before reusing it. Okay, wonderful. We've just got one minute left. Um, there's a few questions around integrated skills testing. Um, Someone's asked if you can recommend any reading about integrated skills assessment and then um, somebody else has asked if you have a particular approach that you'd recommend for integrating integrated skills assessment online. Um, okay, so, so a really useful starting place uh, is the new companion volume for the CEFR and the, the work that's been done on mediation. Uh, many of the mediation scales are at heart talking about language as integrated language use. Um, they are uh, they're really focusing on the fact that in order to, to mediate language from a text to a, a user who couldn't access them, that text for themselves, which is what teachers do all the time, um, we need to use language in, con uh, in combination. Um, I've done, uh, this is kind of my, my my focus area for the last couple of years, so uh, it could well be a, a question for another another webinar on integrated skills assessment, Sophie, but um, yeah, I would start there. Um, there are, uh, there are, I guess there's a, if you're, if you're looking at it from an academic writing context, then there's a, a great article from 2013 by Cummins, 
which talks about the promises and the perils of integrated uh, uh, assessment, particularly in an academic writing sense. And um, the, uh, the reference list from that article will be very useful as well. Uh, the, the question about online setting, um, I think it's just really being being aware of the potential of, of the online uh, space in terms of what we can do quite effectively with the, the tools that are free or, or um, adapting our VLE capacity is to put uh, input content, whether that's text or, or audio or video based content into a space and then have the response format in that same space. So you can have that as, um, let's say you uh, you have a, an extended writing task using a Google form and you embed the, the listening that's the input as, the, as part of that Google form, then you have that listening into, into writing uh, within a, a free digital space. So the first step is to think about what's the output that you're going to measure and in integrated skills that will probably be a piece of uh, constructed writing or, or an extended spoken response. What's the format that you're going to use to capture that for assessment purposes? Is that, um, uh, is that something like uh, VoiceThread, which is a, a free tool where learners can give their response using their microphone or their webcam? And then what's the task that you're going to put into that? Um, so VoiceThread's a nice one for uh, uh, collaborative responses to a task, maybe more in a kind of informal uh, assessment approach. But there are lots of digital tools where you can capture learners' voice response, and then you think about what's the task that I'm going to ask them to do uh, to, to lead into that. And you know, this is not something I I, uh, uh, I think I'm alone on here. There's a lot of organisations out there that are taking this approach as their um, as their approach to the assessment construct. If we look at uh, the TOEFL IBT, there are tasks in there that are combine a listening input and a reading input into a, uh, a 250 word essay task. You know, it's, it's listening and reading into writing as the construct. The Pearson Academic Test, the construct explained in the writing task is not writing, it's listening into writing. You know, the, these are already out there in some of the, the major exam boards as um, a priori integrated skills are, are the construct. I, yeah, I, I'd okay. go so far as to argue that in real world language use, um, are there really any times in which we, we write or speak without having any input from, from some other source beforehand? It's very rare to be in a situation where someone just says, okay, I'd like to talk for two minutes without any background and so I think you know, there's a lot of authenticity in integrated skills. Hmm. Yeah I'd agree with you for sure. Um, okay well uh, it's time for us to finish up. Thank you so much for generously coming and presenting and answering all of our questions as well. It was a really informative foray into a host of issues about online assessment. I thought it was particularly interesting to look at the advantages of online testing and also consider some of the opportunities that COVID-19 has given us to reconsider a perhaps broader approach to assessment. So thanks everyone thank you, for Brian, coming for the and uh, thank you again Tom. Okay thanks everyone, goodbye from Norwich. <laughs>